as we get started, let me remind you again of the vision for Hollywood Christian School. Remember, Hollywood Christian School will become a catalyst for world-class kingdom-centered education. And I repeat that phrase over and over and over again. Like I tell people, if it's repeated, it's because it's important. And so I repeat that because I want you to make that connection between what we're doing at HCS and where God has us going as a school. And this morning, today's message is linked to this vision because we're taking that concept and that vision about the kingdom and we're discussing it all throughout this year. Now, if you've been here the last couple of years, then you've heard the kingdom being taught in this school. What we're doing different this year is we're taking things from point A to point B and we're taking our time and we're making it plain and we're just laying it out so everybody can understand it. Is that all right? Thank you. All right, here's our big question uh, that we're trying to answer for today. Uh, and, and that is simple. How was the birth of Jesus related to the prophecies concerning uh, the kingdom of God? And in your Bible classes, Mr. R probably introduced you to Matthew chapter 1 and Matthew chapter 2 already. He kind of gave you a background of it, gave you a synopsis, so that you can kind of have a little bit of information about where we're going this morning. That scripture is long and it's a lot, so I don't have enough time to break it down here. That's why he introduced it to you in Bible class, so that I can just reference it and we can be able to get to the meat of where we're trying to go in today's message. So our background scripture for today is Matthew chapter 1 and Matthew chapter 2. And if you read that scripture, you know that Matthew chapter 1 is primarily a genealogy. It's just a list of the lineage of Jesus Christ, how he came to be, who was his, his father, his, his grandfather, his great-grandfather, and all the way back uh, to Adam. So there's a very long genealogy in chapter 1. And it, it's very tempting when you read your Bible to skip over the genealogy. But when you are discussing the Bible from a kingdom perspective, every genealogy you run across is important because what's happening is it's showing you how the lineage of the kingdom of God is being transferred from one generation to another. And it, it, you kind of get bored with it because all it's talking about is who begot who and so-and-so was the father of so-and-so. But in a kingdom, that's very important because in a kingdom, you don't have citizenship by virtue of being voted into the kingdom of God. You have citizenship in the kingdom of God by virtue of your birth. And that may seem like a strange statement until later on when we talk about it, we get to stuff like the, the concept of being born again. Why do we have to be born again? Well, from a kingdom perspective, being born again makes sense. Because if you are born again in Christ, then you're born again into the kingdom of God. But we take that apart later on in some of our scriptures that we'll be discussing in later sessions. But in Matthew chapter 1 verse, or rather Matthew chapter 2, there's a discussion about the actual birth of Jesus Christ. Now, that leads us to the second habit we tend to have when we read the Bible, is we tend to take the story about the birth of Jesus Christ and we push it off to Christmas. And we cover it up with gifts and toys and devices and gadgets and all kind of things that make us happy. happy and, and we forget about the power of the birth of Jesus Christ because it's covered in Christmas. So we don't really see it necessarily when we take Matthew chapter 2 and we push it off to, to Christmas or we take Luke chapter 1 and chapter 2 and we push it off to Christmas. But when we take this and we look at it for what it is from a kingdom perspective, we see the very power behind all of this. So we see this story in Matthew chapter 2 of the Virgin Mary being visited by an angel and she's being told that she was going to bear the very Son of God. And again, you push it off to Christmas and immediately we go to all right, when is December the 25th coming? Because I want to get all of my gifts and I want to get everything that, that mom and daddy have bought for me. But from a kingdom perspective, that's a very, very important transition in the kingdom of God. Because other than the actual creation and the very end of time, this is one of the most significant events in the Bible itself. And not only is it significant in the Bible, it's significant for us personally as well. But to understand the power of Jesus' birth and the significance and the impact it has for us, we actually have to go all the way back to the beginning of the Bible. So if you have your Bible, you look in Genesis chapter 1, verse 1, you probably already know this scripture by heart, but you probably read it so quickly that we've missed the potence of it. It says in Genesis chapter 1, verse 1, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Sounds like a simple statement, doesn't it? But it's a very powerful statement. Because one of the questions we can easily ask at this point is why? 
mean, we're talking about an all-powerful, almighty, all-knowing God who has absolutely every single thing he could possibly want or need. You can't add to him and you can't take away from him. So why? Why does he have a need to do this? The, the, the simple answer to that is it's not a need, it's a desire. God had a desire to reflect his spiritual kingdom in a physical world. God had a desire to reflect his spiritual kingdom in a physical world. Now, one thing you have to understand about a kingdom is that the central component to any kingdom is the king. However the king is, the kingdom will be the same way. That means that if God is love, then his kingdom is going to be a kingdom of love, and love is going to be demonstrated throughout his kingdom. It means that if God is an eternal God, that means that his kingdom is eternal. That's how kingdoms function and operate. However the king is, that's how the kingdom is going to be. This is why Satan got kicked out of heaven, because the kingdom of God is a righteous kingdom, because God is a righteous God. And Jesus said that he saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven when he rebelled against God. Why? Because it's a righteous kingdom, and unrighteousness cannot dwell in the kingdom of God. And so God desired to reflect his spiritual kingdom, which was already in existence, the spiritual kingdom of God, heaven, has no beginning, it has no end, because it's all in him. So since heaven has no, since God has no actual beginning and no actual end, then neither does his spiritual kingdom. But in the beginning of time, everybody say time. In the beginning of time, God decided to represent his spiritual kingdom in a physical world. And that's what the creation story reveals to us. So if we look at Genesis chapter 1, verse 26, moving ahead in creation, it says, Then God said, Let us make man in our image, after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the heavens, and over the livestock, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. And God blessed them. And God said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the heavens, and over every living thing that moves on the earth. I'm not going to spend too much time talking about that because we kind of dwelt on that last time when we came together. But here's the main thing we see from that. God equipped man to colonize the earth with his kingdom. How many of you are in a history class right now? Nobody is in a history class. That's hard to believe. All right. Almost all of you are in some type of history class. Any of y'all ever studied American history yet? We know that American, America began with 13 what? Colonies. colonies. Thank you. We're waking up now. We're getting there. Our country began with 13 colonies. Everybody say colonies. Uh, the reason why they were called colonies were because those territories were set up to reflect the kingdom that they came from. They were colonies of another kingdom. So they were set up in a different territory. That's how kingdoms work. That's how they function. That's how they operate. The kingdom of God is without exception in that nature. God was colonizing earth with the culture of heaven. This is why Jesus made statements like, you are the light of the world. Or you are like a city set upon a hill. Or like you are the salt of the earth. Because you are designed to reflect heaven down here on earth. And, and this is why we have conflict whenever believers, Christians, kingdom citizens don't function the way that they're supposed to. Because you're not carrying out the will of God. You're not carrying out the will of the kingdom whenever you're not functioning as you should be on the earth, because we're supposed to colonize earth to make it look just like heaven. Remember when Jesus prayed what we call the Lord's Prayer? He said, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be your name, your what? Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it already is in heaven. That was even in Jesus' prayer. So when Jesus prayed, he was praying that earth would begin to reflect heaven. And our job is to make earth look like heaven. That's what we're here to do. So God equipped man to colonize the earth with heaven. But then we see something else. If we move up to Genesis chapter 3, we see in verse 6, So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was a delight to the eyes, and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, 
she took its fruit and ate. And she also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate. Then the eyes of both were open, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loincloths. So even though they were set up in a perfect situation, in a perfect circumstance, they made the mistake that we talked about last week. They began to mess up God's design. God designed them to rule over the earth, but they fell victim to the enemy's thoughts and decided, you know what? If we eat this fruit, just like this serpent just said to us, we can rule right now. We don't have to do it God's way. We don't have to follow God's plan necessarily. He just don't want us to be like him. And so they short circuit God's plan by messing with his design. This is why you have to understand how God has designed his kingdom, how God has designed the earth to operate in a function, and how God has designed you in his kingdom. Because when you mess up God's design, you begin to mess up purpose. And when you start messing up purpose, you begin to mess with identity. So here's the third point. Man failed to follow God's design, which distorted purpose. Confused identity. And because of his unrighteousness, man was exiled from the kingdom of God. Remember, God is a righteous king. And so since God is a righteous king, his kingdom is a righteous kingdom. And unrighteousness cannot dwell in his kingdom. The other thing about a kingdom you have to understand is that citizens of a kingdom are legally bound to carry out the will of the king or they are living in active rebellion against him. Whenever you serve a king, he takes full responsibility for you. But if you're living in active rebellion against that king, he cuts you off from his kingdom because that can be disruptive. So man had to be exiled from the kingdom of God. And so now we have a problem because we run across verses, where, for example, where Jesus said, it's not those that call me Lord, Lord, that shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but it's they that do the will of my father. So here's the, here's the simple point in that. If you're not doing the will of God, you cannot belong to his kingdom. Let us sink in for a second. If you're not doing the will of God, you cannot belong to his kingdom. Because man was unrighteous, he put himself in a position where he could no longer fulfill the will of God. We have a serious problem here. We have a very serious problem. This means that for all eternity, man would have to be cut off from God. We need a solution, don't we? So from the very beginning when man first fell, the Bible says this in Genesis chapter 3, verse 14. The Lord God said to the serpent, because you have done this, cursed are you above all livestock and all, above all beasts of the field. On your belly you shall go, and dust you shall eat the days of your life. I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. So from the very beginning, God began to put an action plan in place to solve this problem. Because without that solution being in place, we were bound for death. There was no other alternative. God is a source of life, and without him, we cannot have anything. Without him, we cannot have life. Without him, we cannot have strength. Without him, we cannot have hope. Without him, we cannot have joy. Without him, we can do nothing. So you would think that God was caught off surprise, but he wasn't, which brings us to our fourth point. Plans can change, but God's purpose does not. Now, I'm going to stop right here for a minute. I'm going to make this personal for you because here's what you need to understand about life. So far, most of you have lived at the most about 18 years. You haven't seen it all yet. And for most of you, your parents have protected you from most of your pain. But let me tell you now, you can have it set and fixed in your mind right now, even at your age, what God wants you to do. But there will come seasons, there will come times, there will come moments in life where things can disrupt your plan. When things disrupt your plan in that way, it doesn't matter what it is. It could be your parents getting a divorce. It could be you losing a loved one. It could be you not being accepted into the college that you want to get into. 
It could be that, that, that girl you thought was going to be with you forever decided she wanted to be with somebody else. It could be a young man hurting your feelings. It could be anything that disrupted the plans that you thought you had. But plans can change. Purpose does not. So don't get discouraged because things come along that change your plan. The Bible says that many are the plans in the heart of a man. But it is the Lord's counsel that shall stand. If you get nothing else today, make sure you get that. Plans can change, but purpose cannot. When your plan changes and you get knocked down by life, you get up and you get back to purpose. Y'all understand me? When life knocks you down, you get back up and you get back to your purpose. Plans can change, but purpose does not. Genesis chapter 17 reveals this. When you begin to look at the scriptures as a whole, you see this theme leading all the way up to the birth of Christ. And you see God began to move his promise from generation to generation to generation. And in Genesis chapter 17, we see the promise of God's kingdom that he just made in Genesis chapter 3 being now transferred to Abraham. It says, no longer shall your name be called Abram, but your name shall be Abraham. For I have made you the father of a multitude of nations. I will make you exceedingly fruitful. And I will make you into nations and kings shall come out of you. The plan might have changed, but God's purpose is still the same. Then you come up to Isaiah. I think we shared this scripture last time. You come up to the prophet. When you read the Bible in the book of the prophets, all they're doing is they're reminding the people about God's promises. They're reminding the people about God's covenant. They're reminding the people about God's law so that they can be focused on fulfilling his purpose and his will. Isaiah 9 and 6 says this, For to us a child is born. This is another scripture you hear a lot at Christmas, but it really doesn't have anything to do with Christmas. For unto us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government, everybody say government, shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and of peace, there will be no end. This is why you hear me say over and over again, the kingdom of God is not a religion. The kingdom of God is not a religion. Say that with me. The kingdom of God is not a religion. It's not. Jesus never brought a religion. Jesus never came to spread a religion. When Jesus came, Jesus came to spread his kingdom. So whenever you don't allow God's kingdom to work through you, but you're spreading religion, you have to understand that that's not what Jesus designed us to do. That's not the purpose that Jesus brought to the earth. He never came to establish religion. When people try to establish religion, you know what happened? Wars break out. This is why some people are so afraid of extreme Muslims. Because they have this religious mindset that they're carrying with them throughout the earth. When you try to spread religion, you get wars. You get division. You get social problems. But Jesus never established a religion. He came to establish his kingdom, which is a form of government. And then we come on up to Luke, which reflects the story that we were looking at in Matthew chapter 1. In Luke chapter 1, the Bible says this, In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth, to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. And the virgin's name was Mary. And he came to her and said, Greetings, O favorite one, the Lord is with you. But she was greatly troubled at the saying and tried to discern what sort of greeting this might be. And the angel said to her, watch this, watch this, watch this. Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. Keep watching. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a what? Son. Hmm. We just read that in Isaiah, didn't we? And you shall call his name what? Jesus. And he will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. And the Lord will give to him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. And of his kingdom, everybody say kingdom, there will be no end. Same thing we just read in Isaiah, isn't it? All the prophets pointed to Christ. All the prophets pointed to him. Which brings us to our fifth point. Through the birth of Christ, 
God fulfilled his plan to restore man back into the plans for his kingdom. See, some of us think that Jesus only came to save us from our sin. That's only a part of the story. Jesus did not come just to save us from our sin. There was a reason behind that salvation. And the reason behind that salvation was so that we could re-enter the same kingdom that we had originally been exiled from. Now, we still had a problem because you're still unrighteous. And because you're unrighteous, guess what? You can't be in the kingdom of God. The only way you can come into the kingdom of God is by accepting the righteousness of Christ. Paul put it this way. He said, we are now become the righteousness of Christ. In other words, when God looks at us, he's not looking at our unrighteousness. He's looking at whether or not we are wearing the righteousness of Christ. In other words, have we accepted him? Do we live for him? Are we committed to him? Are we following the will that he gave us to do? And I could go on and on and on and on. What happens next, and we'll talk about it more next week, what happens next really began to outline the major reason why we focus so much on the kingdom. Because now we've gotten to the birth of Christ and we know that we've been set up to once again reign in God's kingdom the way he originally designed us to do. We're back at that dominion mandate now. We've been equipped, we've been blessed, we've been designed now to be fruitful and to be great. But what happens next really begins to point the way to why we truly have to understand and know the kingdom of God. 